Hello and welcome to the Find Your Feminine Fire podcast. I am your host, Amanda Testa. I am a sex, love, and relationship coach. And in this podcast, my guests and I talk sex, love, and relationships and everything that lights you up from the inside out. Welcome. Our voice is such a powerful tool in being able to express ourselves and allow our authentic music, whatever form that might be, allowing it to come out is such a powerful and important tool. And I am so excited because today I'm talking with Lisa Townsend and she is a board certified music therapist and creative vocal coach. And what I love about Lisa and her work is it really, she has such a passion for creating space for exploration. So you can speak and sing with courage and authenticity and really using music as a tool for inspiring leaders to really overcome any kind of limiting belief around their voice. Because our voice, there is sometimes, and I can share from my own experience in the past, like really not liking the sound of my voice, um, not feeling like I could express myself in the way I wanted to. And these are just normal things I think that we face in life. And so I'm really excited to talk with Lisa today and just I've been so passionate about the voice lately too, because I have just been inspired to sing and I've been taking singing lessons and just really diving into this topic. And I find it so fascinating. So Welcome. Thank you so much for being here, Lisa. Thank you for having me. I love talking voice. I love people who just love using their voice in lots of different ways, podcasting, singing. Mm -hmm. So I'm thrilled to have the conversation. Thanks. Yes. And I just want to shout out something. I just went to an experience that Lisa hosted earlier this week, and it was so lovely. It was a soul singing session. And basically we had these intentions and then we sang them and it was the most amazing meditation like expression. It was so fun. So I just love, love, love what you're doing. And I am excited to share, to share you with the the listeners. And yeah, I'd love to, you know, if you just wouldn't mind letting me know and like just sharing with the listeners a little bit of your journey and why singing, why working with the voice became such a passion for you. I would love to. I, so I grew up in Western New York and my maternal grandmother, who is 92, she just turned 92 she was a singer in the family and she, we would play piano and she would teach me harmonies. We'd go to the theater. And my dad loved, was self-taught guitar and loved singing like the Eagles and the Beatles. So I grew up around music in that way. I did choirs. I performed in church shows, you know, high school choir and theater. And when I decided what I, well, I was trying to decide what I wanted to do, I had loved, I had loved, loved, loved my high school choir director. He had just made such an impact I love the community that we built together through music. And it wasn't about singing notes. It was about, you know, the collaborative, co-creative process of sharing our voices together and the beauty and magic that that can happen uh, when we do that. So I thought I wanted to be, I don't know, a choir director, music education. And I went to college for music education at the same university he went to. And I right away knew it was not for me. (laughs) It's one of those internal knowings. I do not actually want to teach a classroom of music, you know, traditional music uh, education. I later found out about music therapy, uh, the degree of music therapy, and without knowing too much about it, went down to visit a college in North Carolina, where I learned that music therapy was more about using music as a tool for non-musical goals. And what was exciting about that to me is that it was about experiential, you know, it wasn't about reading rhythms and music theory and, you know, some of the um, elements of music that can be really intimidating and overwhelming. Honestly, I feel like I was guided to this for so many reasons. So when I realized, you know, music didn't have to be the end product, it was part of the journey. I mean, I was in, and I got to see right away in the onsite uh, clinic that they had, you know, what that looked like in a session. And then moved later into doing some family music classes again, for the experience of music, having families sing together, I realized so many of the mothers didn't love singing. They were highly aware of their voice in class and maybe embarrassed about it, even though all of them were embarrassed. It wasn't, (laughs) it always took one brave soul and me to kind of lead the group and really overly encouraging them to be silly and goofy and playful. And there is a piece of that that we lose when we're older. And I'm kind of skipping some in between about how I've used music therapy in my work, but to jump from music is the tool, not the performance aspect. I saw it showing up and I thought, if mamas aren't singing with their babies, what is wrong with the world? <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so true. Well, it's funny that you mentioned that because, you know, I grew up with music too. My dad loved music and live music. And I think my parents went and saw Elvis when I was in the womb and like, we were always yes. listening to music and uh, 
I grew up playing piano for 12 years and guitar, and banjo, like whatever instrument I wanted to play. My parents were very supportive. I'm very grateful for that privilege of being able to just explore and have fun with it. I was in choirs and things, but never thought my voice was very good. So I kind of just, you know, I guess when I got to college, I played guitar and things like that. Love live music. You know, I was a deadhead and went seen so many live shows. I just love music so much. And it is it's such a great way of connecting and just dropping into a different realm. But I do recall when my daughter was born and singing to her, I was like, I don't think I've sung in like 15 years. The first time I was like trying to sing and it felt so weird. And I felt like every time I would sing, I would cry. It was just like, oh, it's interesting. So I can relate to those moms that are like, you know, like singing the Rafi songs or whatever it is. It's like six little ducks went out to play and you can't even sing it even now. I just love, I just think it's so funny to, to remember that. So thank you for <laughs> triggering that memory in me. Thank you for that memory. It's sharing that because it, it speaks to that our, our voice is one of the most vulnerable things we have and public speaking, whether we're on zoom, whether we're on a stage, those are two different kinds of speaking. It's still our voice. Then you add a tone or a note to a word and suddenly you're singing the most vulnerable thing you can do. And it really, it can tap into emotions. And I think we're afraid of places we've not explored before, which absolutely, you know, kind of takes us into the next part of the conversation, which is, I, I'll skip over a, a bit of this, but I, I'll just drop in a tiny bit. The moms singing to their babies. I decided, I decided to play with the idea. What if I took parents' words and set them to music? And I did a simple song. It's not Adele singing a, a lullaby. <laughs> It's Lisa singing <laughs> like with a very accessible, simple sound that, that then if, cause we all mimic our favorite artists. Well, fine. I'm not going to give you anything that you can't do. I'm going to create things in a key that's comfortable at a tempo that's slow. And you're going to give me the words and I'm just going to, you know, set them to music for you. So there should be less vulnerability because it's things you say to your children all the time or hopes and wishes you have for them. Maybe that takes away some of the vulnerability. So I, and I I do still do some of that, but it's more kind of word of mouth at this point. Then fast forward to, okay, when did people tell us that we couldn't sing? And and again, I'm coming at this from a a singing lens today, but I think it's highly, you know, it's very applicable to speaking in any, the ways we use our voice, the many ways we use our voice. When did that happen? I think that happens around age six or seven. When we start to have a reflection of what others think about us, we can see ourselves in, in other people's eyes. And can I talk to women who are mothers, who are in their thirties and forties, who maybe need to be reminded that the stories that they tell themselves maybe aren't their stories. And those are habits that we've created. And singing is a tool like anything else, taking your voice to the gym, learning new techniques, exploring new scary places and approaching it from a sense of play. What if, what if we did that? (laughs) And I created a community choir where the sole purpose was we love harmonies. We love hearing and singing harmonies. Let's create them simple, easy, beautiful. Our favorite hippie bands from the sixties, seventies, all those gorgeous Eagles, CCR, Crosby, Stills, Nash. Yeah. All of those gorgeous, rich harmonies. Can we create that? We're just like normal people. Yes, we can. And here's how. And it takes, you know, developing an ear for sound and knowing what your voice feels like. And yeah, so many things. So all of that exploration without going into too much detail is how I decided that my ideal client is people who have been told they can't or shouldn't sing, (laughs) who are trying to be more dynamic and bold with their voice or really kind of want to, but are, have some, some limitations, whether that's self-imposed or, you know, societally, you know, shared with them at some point and they, they took it on as their own. Yeah. And I think, uh, I know for myself, I can remember a distinct moment of hearing that I wasn't a good singer, you know, trying out for some solo and choir and not getting the parts or whatever, right? Those kind of things at the time might not seem like a big deal, but they do stick with you. And so I'm wondering, you know, what are some of the other limiting beliefs that you see around voice with people? Yeah, it's a good question. And I, I do think you speak to everyone has a moment. Everyone has a moment where they were told they were too much or not enough, or, you know, you're too quiet, you're too loud, you, and, and whether or not that's tied to singing, again, you and I are in the world where we're sharing our voice, we're sharing a message. Where does that stop us in a way that we, we didn't realize that's, that's not our story. That's not, that's actually not true. That was someone else's truth. Mm-hmm. And, 
And we just may not have had the ability to kind of let it roll off our shoulders. And so we carry that with us. I would say, I, I just made myself a voice note before we hopped on that said something like, we all have, we all have the script I can't sing, or we all, I I don't know if it's like a a script that is like socially acceptable, Mm -hmm. that when someone says something about voice, even, even me, I'm a vocalist. I don't always own that because I'm not on an American Idol stage. Again, that's the narrative (laughs) I'm trying to change. It's a practice. It doesn't, doesn't just happen overnight. Where does that come from? So I think Mm -hmm. most often it's people either sincerely believing they don't or can't sing. I don't hit that note. Well, well, I mean, there are a lot of questions around that note. Is it the right note for you? Are you pushing? Are you, are you feeling vocal effort? Did you wake up? Did you not sleep well? Have you not had water in 24 hours? There's so many reasons why you can't hit a note. And that actually doesn't mean you can't sing. It means we need to have an awareness about how we create sound. And then you can say, oh, I'm struggling with this. Is there anything I can do to adjust so that it's more comfortable? And or that I find it more beautiful. So anyway, that, that script of, oh, I, I don't sing or, well, I sing, but only in the shower. Yeah. Oh, you know, I, yeah, I can't hit high notes. Yeah. And we're always comparing ourselves with our mm-hmm. favorite artists who are live music. Is it, that's where you hear, hear the raw mm-hmm. voice from a studio. You are not going to hear all the tricky spots that we all have in our voice. You know, it's, it's not a perfect art. It's not right. perfect. It's like, you know, it is true. It's just like looking at a magazine. It's Photoshopped. It's not real. That's not, you know, that's not the reality. And that's what happens when you go, you know, when you're listening to artists on the radio or listening to studio perfected, um, auto-tuned, like cleaned Mm -hmm. up songs, no one's going to sound like that. But I think, you know, what I love about it though, is just how it can be a way to connect with your authentic voice and to listen to your voice, to express without judgment. And I really think I love new ways to be able to express yourself confidently because it shows up in every area of your life, right? Whether you're singing or whether you're speaking or whether you're trying to connect with someone new or whether you're trying to communicate your needs in the bedroom, right? It's all so connected. And so I'd love if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit more around things that, you know, what you you think that are some tips that you can do around, you know, just appreciating your voice for what it is or not judging what comes out of your mouth. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Lifelong practices, but yes, there are some tips. And I think what you speak to is first is awareness. Another piece of this is resonance practice. Um, and so we can talk about those in depth, but I was talking with a friend recently who reminded me that, you know, nothing gets you more comfortable with your own voice than in sharing it with others and getting comfortable hearing yourself. So we take ourselves to the gym or we get outside and exercise to remind our muscles what to do. We need to do that. And voice work is one really fun way, whether you have a coach, whether you hop on YouTube, whether you honestly, whether you just sing along, a lot of people are even just uncomfortable, you know, singing out loud. I think a lot of us sing in our heads, you know, we have music on and we kind of sing it around in our heads, but physically using our instrument in a way that you can hear yourself is like taking yourself to the gym. And the more you do it, the more it becomes second nature. And the more it becomes second nature, the less you second guess it because you say, oh, that's just me. I know how I sound or, oh, that's just, I I don't know if you have a story around that, around podcasting. I imagine that is something that happens for those of us who use our voice in a recorded way and hear it over and over again, that initially the judgment is so high. And the more you kind of use it, use that muscle, the less activated or triggered yeah. you might be by the the sound. I don't know if you have something to share around that, but I, I find that fascinating. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because I think I can remember times in the past where I would listen to my voice on a recording and be like, that does not sound like me. And also just how my voice has changed over the years. Cause I grew up in Georgia and I don't really have an accent anymore. And I found this random mixtape back in the day. Remember those? We used to make yes. those and my friend and I would send <laughs> cassettes back and forth to each other. And I was listening to the voice. I was like, who is that? I was like, oh my God, that's me. (laughs) Yeah. Yes, but it is true. It's like the judgment we have. But now after using my voice for my work for so many years, I'm just very used to it and the sound of it. But I do know it can be really hard just because sometimes I'll invite my my students to record something and then listen back to it because that does affect Mm -hmm. your brain in different ways when you listen to your own voice. And it's a really hard thing to do for a lot of people, like a really hard. Yes. Yeah. And one of the tips I use or tools I use in one-on-one voice work and also in my group work has been asynchronous feedback, meaning actually primarily I have used Marco Polo, which is video and, you know, a video message. 
I played, I I met one of my former clients last night for dinner and she and her husband, we were playing and, and I said, you know, this has been such a good tool, but people really resist doing it because they can see themselves and hear themselves. And that is really tricky. And if you're not having a conversation with someone and you're just looking at yourself, I mean, in the world of social media, now we're doing all sorts of reels and things on, you know, Instagram or going live and you just see yourself and it's like, you're in this echo chamber. It feels very funny until you practice it. And then you kind of say, Oh, I'm here. I'm in my zone. I'm going to find my flow. But to your point, it takes a considerable amount of effort to see yourself or hear yourself over and over again and get through kind of like those uncomfortable moments or ask, Hey, I noticed this about my voice and finding someone you can say a mentor, you know, is there a way to change that? Or is that typical? Or is that, you know, is that something that's so noticeable that actually I should, I should think about keeping it because it makes people recognize my voice in, in the crowd. You know, there are some things about our voice that we think are maybe that are uncomfortable for us to hear, but make us notable in a crowd. And so what we're talking about here is exposure, <laughs> right? Just like frequent exposure. And that can be through, like I said, just singing out loud, making sure you hear yourself a little often being really playful with your sound and not afraid to try new things, which seems silly, but think about singing your favorite sound, like a song, like a character, you know, in a kind of a character voice and just see, you know, what comes out and what it's it's like playing with your old mixtapes, as you described, and just hearing and saying, you know, that's, that's, that is, that's my authentic voice. Now I have an authentic voice and what, what could I do with the tools that I have? Um, Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's very interesting to have just the, just the awareness. Awareness is step one. Then you can think about being playful. Then you can take it deeper into, okay, that's my voice. I don't sound sure of myself. Is that because the message I'm speaking doesn't feel like it's my truth? Like, am I saying something I want people to hear? Or something Mm -hmm. that, yeah, that they want to hear from me and maybe not my full authentic truth. And the word for that is resonance. Oh, you know, I might have to backpedal and say, that's not exactly what I meant and say it again. And then you can feel resonance. It's some, it's a way we sound with our voice. We can be resonant and you can feel like it resonates. And I know we were talking about this earlier, but with that resonance and how you can communicate with more confidence through you know, learning to love your voice and working with it in different ways, like singing or just even playfully. I love how you mentioned the archetypes. You're like just playing with a different voice because it can be so powerful to be, to use archetypal play to heal or to try something new. And I love that. And so the other thing that you just mentioned, which I, which I think is important is kind of like the authentic voice. And like you mentioned this when we were talking before about the phrasing and like how you, how you speak, if you end your voice in certain ways, It's like question mark versus a truth. And I'm wondering if that comes into play when you're speaking that just now, like when I'm talking, is this really what I want to say? Or this is what I want to say, or like how you can speak to that a little more. That's so fun to think about. Okay. So let's think about how music and voice are, you know, overlap. This is, this is my zone of genius and and, and zone of interest and play, but our subconscious will make our voice do things. You know, we just speak without thinking oftentimes, right? Voice work calls us in to say, okay, let's have a little bit more awareness around this. I, this is a podcast episode. Am I a little nervous? Yes. Are, are you a familiar person? Yes. But now we're being recorded. Now I'm looking at myself on Zoom. Now I'm with headphones that I haven't used before. All of these things make me think, okay, I know what I know. And yet now there's a spotlight moment. So I like to think of things and in, in there are lots of different spotlight moments and that can be speaking up in a group program. It can be on an interview. And the first awareness I had, I'll, I'll walk you through my process today. I'm excited. I can feel the excitement in my chest. I am speaking high in my chest. I can feel it. As you were talking, I took a really low belly breath to recenter myself and, and kind of just reminded myself, Lisa, you're so excited. Connect a little deeper, connect a little lower. And you'll find your flow again, not that I haven't had it, but a different, a different flow that then to me signals my body. You can pace your language, your words, your phrases differently. You don't have to tell everybody everything once (laughs) people can feel your excitement like this. It's really hard to listen when things are just going like this. You can tell when someone's not taking a deep breath and that they don't speak between their, you know, they don't breathe between their sentences. not a bad thing. It's a practice and, and it happens every time. So one of the, some of the tools I like to talk about that are, you know, parallel speaking and breathing is yes. So phrasing, 
So thinking about any phrase in a beautiful arc, like not a mountain peak, just a hill, that we have peaks and valleys, both with how many words we say in a phrase, the melody of our voice in one of those phrases, when we intentionally take breath, and to your point, how we both begin and end a sentence. And I'm using my hands a lot. It's not a visual medium podcasting, but you know, you can see that I'm kind of giving you these hand gestures where if we're maybe not checked in and not aware, we might end a sentence with our voice on an uptick. So did you know that we have so many different tools for our voice? Yes, we do. I mean, you give, you give these little clues that sometimes you want to intentionally do that to capture attention. And other times you might end it on a high and people are like, wait, wait, you left me hanging. What, what do you need from me? And that takes their ears away from the message that you're trying to convey. So knowing how those peaks and valleys in your melody, you know, the melody of your voice, what intentional breaths can feel and look like to your audience and, and to you, and then how you're ending your sentences with intention so that your message is being heard as you intended. All really fun things to play with in singing and feel very weird to do just speaking. Yeah. But I think, you know, like you say, for so many of us in this day and age, it is, we are, have to be visible, right? Whether it's, there's just a lot more going on, a lot more video, a lot more just being visible. And being able to kind of learn these different ways to express yourself, I think, is a really powerful thing. And I also, you know, being able to speak more courageously, you know, having more bravery and using your voice. I'm curious how you feel singing helps with that. I mean, isn't singing the most brave thing you can do? <laughs> yes. I mean, it is one of those, I mean, a simple fact that like, as we said earlier, singing is one of the most vulnerable things you can do. And it is a practice. And, you know, I don't know how public speaking coaches or speaking coaches, I think they just do a lot of practice, right? A little more like an acting class where you might put on a character and you might play with all these same, same tools, but in music, it's built in. It's built in. I mean, A, they're not your words. So you're less emotional, emotionally attached to them, maybe in the moment. Later down the line, you can actually play with those based on how you're telling the story. But on the front end, not my words. I just get to play with the phrasing. I get to choose or hear where the natural, the music guides me to breathe. I know I can't hit certain notes if I don't have enough breath support. If I don't have breath support, that means I'm not checking in with my core. Okay, I have to activate my core. I have to activate my shoulders. I have to, you know, know what a full breath feels like. And then I need to know where, where my voice is landing and how to adjust throughout. All of those things are so important for speaking and much more fun to play with in song. Because again, it's, it's kind of a roadmap for your voice naturally. And what we like to do in voice work is deconstruct a song. So not only do we listen to how the original artist did it, but then we kind of, <laughs> I tell my clients, it's like naked singing because I just have the piano accompaniment. There's a delay on Zoom. So they, you know, they... I can't always hear them full voice because of the sound delay. So it allows them in their safe space to play with their voice without their favorite artist and hear themselves. And I say, okay, well, did that feel good? Did you like the sound of it? Okay, if not, what can we do? And, and we adjust and adapt. And then they hear their own voice and naturally find, I have to breathe there. Oh, I'm hitting this. Okay, I need to make sure I'm supported. And, and all of that, that becomes a, a much more of a practice in a two minute and 30 second window because songs are short. <laughs> so it gives you a real timestamp for practicing these both in the context of singing along, singing with a karaoke recording or in our work, which is kind of pulling it out of that original format and hearing your own voice in that way. I love that. And it's like building that muscle. And it sounds like it's also such a powerful way to get into your body, mm -hmm. <laughs> which the is full such an important thing to, you know, when you're wanting to bring your feminine fire alive, like being in your body and singing and just the resonance. And, and just from a therapeutic perspective, would you feel okay sharing a little bit about just the beautiful power of our voice and the vibration and how it like supports us? Yes. I mean, thank you for asking that. <laughs> I think I was just telling you before we recorded that I was listening to one of your episodes about pleasure. And I think one of my deepest wishes is for women to feel pleasure with their voice. And that's individual. It's, in, it's situational. To your point about rev resonance, or as we were speaking about resonance earlier, you know when something feels right or if it doesn't. And I might take this into two different realms. It's, it's kind of like 
the external, this feels good as I'm saying it, I, it, it, it like the, the actual physical, physical act and how I can feel it going out into the world. I could feel the energy of it. This all feels resonant. It feels good. feels pleasurable. feels right and authentic. It can also apply to your inner voice. Is this really what I mean? Is this truly how I wanted to say it? And the, and the voices in our heads, maybe like our, our inner voice and our inner knowing resonance. But is, from a physiological standpoint, you can put your hand on your chest. You can feel it now. If you're talking in your chest voice, there is vibration, right? We often speak pretty low. We speak in this lower chest register and we talk about this space as being warm, yeah, I see you rubbing your tail. Yeah, it's warm, it's low, it can feel really nice. Sometimes it can also, you know, take words out for a second. You can just hum. Mm, mm. If you can hear that with Zoom, but you can, you can take that vibration and send it different places. So we don't think about this in the, in the context of our conversation so far. We're talking about like the practical aspects of using our voice, but not only when we say something that's resonant, but when we place it in a part of our bodies that feels good. I mean, think about the benefits of that. You can feel that inner massage that's happening. And there is a lot of work around toning and voicing. You probably talk about this a lot in body work where creating that energy inside, igniting that feminine power is available to us. And our voice is one of the tools to do that. Yes. It is. There's four main holistic sex tools that I love to teach in, in voices when sounding. But I, I do feel like, you know, because all those vibrations are just the body actually, it's a healing modality too with the vibration, right? And it stimulates the vagus nerve and just helps to bring things online that might be offline. And that's what I love about singing and just like a meditation or anything like that. It just brings you so present in the moment. And that's what I've been loving about my, for my own singing journey lately is just being in the moment. You know, I think that's the beautiful yes. thing about music. It makes you so present, which is so important. And when we get out, when we get out of our bodies and we're always up in our heads, or if it's been, I feel like in our day and age, the culture that we live in is very much like, what's the next thing? Mm -hmm. Like taking the time to like drop in and uh, be with yourself in whatever way that feels good is so important. And I mean, I can, and then the other thing too, that I think is so powerful about, I feel about the work you do is just how you can translate what you've learned through singing and stretching your comfort zone and being brave is that when you go then to just talk to someone that feels a lot easier, right? It's like when you do a, when you're training for a, a race, for example, you know, and you do a lot of, like I've done mountain trail races before. So you do a lot of hills and a lot of running uphill, but then when you're just running along the flats, it feels so easy, which is like singing is the hardest thing ever to do in front of someone. If you can do that, well, then of course you can go speak. <laughs> yeah. It's such a great analogy. You wouldn't, you wouldn't just start running without warming up your body. And so again, the awareness of, you know, is, am I in the right place to start this? Well, yeah, a lot of things we could talk about in that way, but you wouldn't just run on a trail without having done practice beforehand. Stretching is a whole other conversation. I would really, I love the mindfulness piece of, of, of the conversation. And so in that middle of the run, if you just ran cold, fine, your body still has a baseline to work from. And if you're using your voice, if you're practicing, if you're trying new things that you'll never go back to that baseline singing 101 again, you'll have a foundation and then you'll say, oh, but actually I know what's possible and I'm not doing it right now. What can I do to adjust? And it won't be like, I can't sing. It's the end of the world that it won't happen like that. You'll say, I know I have the tools. They might not be accessible to me right now. I might just have to slow down my run stop for a moment and stretch and then get, get back out on the trails again. Cause my body knows what to do. My voice knows what to do. I trust it. I know it's there. I'm going to check in and make sure I can find it again. And singing is a mindfulness practice. You cannot be anywhere else when you're singing. It's very hard. And I think I, one of my favorite conversations recently was around how every line, every line of conversation of song is an opportunity to begin again. And there's nothing else that really allows you that kind of grace and freedom to reset. It's a, it's such a beautiful thing. And, and we also, of course, are tapping into creativity and some of what you, you know, discussed about the you getting into our bodies in a different way. It's a full body experience. And I mean, what a healing thing on its own, just to think about what's happening inside. Yeah, for sure. Taking our head out of it and getting into our bodies. Yeah. And I'm sure this work that you do also helps people trust their voice more. That's it. Right? Yeah. 
it's really remarkable to see people. I'll take an example from this week. Uh, uh, one of my clients, we, we, we started a new genre of music and she's like, I know I can hit that note. I've hit that note before. Why does it feel so high? And we had to kind of dissect why for her, you know, she's, she knows she can hit it, but it was just the technique. It was a setup. It was something. And then in her head, because <laughs> old scripts are hard to flip. She was still telling herself, I can't hit that note. And I was like, we've hit it. We've hit it before. Remember this song? Sing that. Remember this song? You know, but we just kind of played around with, with remembering those moments. And then she thought, okay, I, you know, yeah, I don't know why I'm still telling myself that it's just, it's a practice. It will always maybe always be a practice, but again, you don't start from scratch every time you create building blocks to trust what, you know, be curious about what you don't know and don't maybe not go to all or nothing thinking. I can't do this. It's maybe more, I'm having trouble with this in this moment. Quick reflection. Anything? Why? Anything coming up for me? Okay. No, I'll figure it out later. I'm just going to work with what I have and trust that I have the tools I need for the moment. Powerful skills. (laughs) (laughs) It is. And nobody teaches us, you know, no one teaches us this. It's, um, I feel like we come to it on our own. We come with, you know, coaching and learning from others. And, and then this self-reflection piece, a lot of us are in this space of self-reflection. A lot of people mm-hmm. are not, yeah. but the, those who are kind of inquiring curious, I think there's a lot to explore here. And it takes yeah. it out of, you know, yes, singing. I want singing to be for you. I don't want it to be performative. That's not what it's about. And all of these tools we're talking about with singing apply to speaking. It's just a really fun, creative way and a brave space. You know, there's a little motivation behind it when, when you have the music going, you know, as they say, the show must go on, but in, in the, in the realm of, I have two minutes to do this self-judgment doesn't have, there's no time for that. You're in the moment you're mm-hmm. adjusting in that moment. And think of all the times when you've been, you know, having a conversation and needed to reset and, and stop your and feel comfortable, kind of like quick reset in your mind, reassess and keep going, but you only have split seconds to do that. And voice work really allows you to practice those moments. Mm -hmm. I just so appreciate you and all your wisdom that you've shared. And I know we could go, we've talked about a lot of different things, but I'm wondering if there's maybe one question that I didn't ask that you really wish that I would have asked or so anything else that you wanted to share. Mm -hmm. I just think our voice is one of the most important tools and instruments we have available to us. And I I think we've spoken about this before, but we're talking a lot about external voice, but I'd like to also reflect quickly on the internal voice because we make a lot of decisions, especially as entrepreneurs. And you have to know, it's like, you have to be comfortable listening to yourself to know when the right time to listen is. And I think we can all think of a time where we knew what we knew before we knew it. (laughs) waited too long to take action. And in some cases, I mean, I think of that from a relationship perspective where, you know, we have an internal knowing, but if we're not used to listening to ourselves, we're not going to hear ourselves when it matters. And if everyone could kind of in, in the sense of owning your voice, know that that means not just what people hear, but what you hear. I, I don't know how that would change the world, but I feel like it's pretty, pretty important. And it's a skill that we don't talk often enough about. Yeah. And just in that vein is maybe there one thing that you could share of how we could better listen to that inner voice and honor it. I think it does come down to checking in, listening, and, and just like that awareness when you, and and I think it could be something you practice really simply, you know, with partner or a child, you say something and you think, am I just saying that because it's a script? Am I saying it because it feels right in the moment or would I really like to say something else, but I don't want to take the time to have that conversation right now. And there's no wrong answer, but I think the, the, the piece of knowing the intention behind is one of the first steps and then finding small places to practice where it's not a high stakes opportunity. And so that could be from, I think about people who always say, you yeah, know, where do you want, where do you want to go for dinner? Where do you want to eat? Do you not know? Do you know? I mean, that sounds so simple, but I think you have to trust the smallest steps. You have to like practice it in the least. Yeah. Yeah. The least, that's just these tiny, small ways. And, mm-hmm. and you know how we have to trust ourselves to make decisions and we have to try small, small moments of trust. Same thing with our voice. Yeah. Trust. That little inkling, something mm-hmm. I should follow. I'm going to, I'm going to follow it and see what happens. Will the world collapse? 
if it does, can I, can I trust that, uh, you know, I can, I can bring it back together again. I mean, most often those small moments are not going to the bottom, the bottom is not going to fall out. Right. And if it is uncomfortable because people who are used to communicating with you are not used to hearing you in that way, that is, Mm -hmm. again, it has to be a small step. Oh, Mm -hmm. she's being extra assertive. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's an important thing to practice. So true. Cause so often, you know, people that are conditioned as women in this culture don't always speak up for what they want or they need. And I think that what, that is what's, you can just like break through with that voice and singing. And I'm like, right now I'm like, like letting my chest open up because yes, I see that so often, you know, like of people just not saying what they want or just pleasing or, you know, and there's a lot to that, right? Sometimes there's a lot, there's some things that need to be unwound a little deeper, but still just having these opportunities, which is why music is such a beautiful healing way Mm. to do that and be in your body and enjoy the pleasure of your voice and the sounds that you can make and the ways you can make them. So yes, yes. And know that there are people like you and me out there who want you to be playful and explore your voice. And we are, find the people who are non-judgmental, not singing is a tool for you for so many areas of your life. And Mm -hmm. it's up to you. We all experience music really individually. So it's not up to me as a coach to tell you how to use your voice. It's to give you all of the tools you need that's what makes it authentic. Once you have your toolbox, you get to choose what feels right to you in the moment. And if we can find ways to drop the judgment and settle into, does this feel good? Does it resonate? Do I feel powerful? Do I feel authentic? Yeah. Do I feel like me and not? Yeah. Just let's leave it with that. Do I feel like me, a really good version of me Mm -hmm. that resonates and buzzes and is excited and passionate? then yes, let's find more opportunities to practice that, you know, with whether it's with music or not, find ways to find that, find that feeling, that little fire inside and follow, follow that flame. (laughs) Yes. I love it. Thank you so much. And and I'd love Lisa, if you could just share where everyone can learn more about you and your offerings and how to work with you. Yeah. Well, you can find my uh, website at lisatownsandmusic.com. I'm on Instagram at Lisa Townsend Music. Facebook is the same. And I, as Amanda said, I'm starting a membership, just a monthly membership for women. We're using words as intentions. We're creating musical intentions together. It's very organic and based on the women who, who join each week, it's alive, you know, come and start your week here with your voice feeling strong and bold and with other women who, who also maybe have some fears around their voice. Let's do this together and support one another. And then some group work and some one-on-one work all different stages of exploration for people. Well, thank you so much again. And I just adore you and I'm so excited for all that you're creating. So thank you, Lisa. And thank you for everyone listening. And I'll make sure to put in the show notes where you can connect with Lisa and learn more about what she has to offer. And also just inviting you to perhaps use your voice in some fun ways this week. Yes, please (laughs) do. Yes, and we'll see you next week. Thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Feminine Fire podcast. This is your host, Amanda Testa. And if you have felt a calling while listening to this podcast to take this work to a deeper level, this is your golden invitation. I invite you to reach out. You can contact me at amandatesta.com slash activate. And we can have a heart to heart to discuss more about how this work can transform your life. You can also join us on Facebook and the group Find Your Feminine Fire group. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, please share with your friends. Go to iTunes and give me a five-star rating and a raving review so I can connect with other amazing listeners like yourself. Thank you so much for being a part of the community.